It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of January 23rd, 1998. We've got uh, six movies here, so let's go ahead and jump on and into it, and we'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, and that is The Spice Girls, starring in Spice World. Form for royalty, and entertain millions the world over. But now, they're making... Got any paper? <laughs> a movie. Yeah! Columbia Pictures presents The Spice Girls in their first film. Are we making a movie here or what? All right, we're coming. Spice World. Is my dress it too short? Um, no. <laughs> if you want to be my lover. What an appropriate trailer because this movie is a steaming pile of sh you know what. Um, this is a bad movie, and and uh, this came out right at the peak of Spice Girls, po at the Spice Girls' popularity. I mean, this film was a massive success overseas, and of course in the UK, where these girls come from. Of course, you have um, Mel B, Emma, Victoria, Jerry, and Mel C. I think I'm, I think I said Mel C. I, I think I said Mel B already, but Victoria, Emma, Mel C, Mel B, and of course Jerry, and. Um, this is a movie that is very much in the vein of something like A Hard Day's Night with the Beatles, and I guess that was the point of this. This is trying to be sort of like an equivalent to that, but A Hard Day's Night still holds up after so many years. This, this got dated pretty damn quickly, especially when you consider that the Spice Girls literally broke up the, fr the first time not but a few years after this movie came out. I mean, it had started w when Jerry Hollowell left the, gr left the group in... Um, I think that following May, I think she left the group, and then all of a sudden they had to come. They basically tried to keep it going, but it just didn't last very long. But they have eventually gotten back together on various occasions, and um, this is a weird, weird movie. This is a film that is trying to tell a story, like similar to a Hard Day's Night, but they also add in dream sequences and flashbacks because heaven forbid the dream sequence cliche will not die. God damn it! This movie will make sure that does not happen, and. It really should have died. It really, really, really should have died. But um, but it's just a bizarre movie. It's a film that makes no sense whatsoever. You have this. Uh, I'll tell you. I'll show you what I mean. You have this overzealous newspaper editor who wants to start a smear campaign against the Spice Girls in an attempt to destroy the reputation for his own benefit. Which really, you had to wait just a couple months later for that to happen with Jerry leaving the group and the band kind of disbanding after that point. But. Um, uh, he's played by Barry Humphreys, who you may know as Dame Edna, and in this scene he's talking about his big plan to get is to s split the Spice Girls up, and it should be a, si a normal scene, but it starts off normal, and then this happens. Spice Girls fall out. <laughs> Spice Girls split up. Think how many copies of the paper will sell with a headline like that. I like. I can. Brad, me, Kevin McMaxford, I put him up there, I can bring him down! Yes! Who's gonna help me, Brad? Who is gonna help me take on girl power and bring it crashing and whimpering to the ground? I'll find someone, Kevin. I just wish you wouldn't get so upset. Why does it start raining in the office? I remember seeing this in theaters when I was nine years old and thinking to myself why is this happening like why is the why is it all of a sudden raining inside of the building and what it's still sunny outside so it's like like there's clearly no idea what they were trying to do with this movie all they thought was the spice girls are popular these idiots will buy these idiot teenagers teenage girls will buy anything thing if we put them on screen and i guess they were right because this was a gigantic hit all over and there's just nothing going on in this story whatsoever i mean there's nothing interesting going on here. They just throw stuff at the wall at you to try to give you somewhat of a threat of a storyline, and there's just nothing there. And I, I'm saying all this like I'm bad-mouthing the Spice Girls. I love the Spice Girls, man. Their music overall is really damn good. Like, it's a music I go back to, and I'm just kind of like, I start humming the songs, and I will start singing the songs while they're at the same time. It's just like, these songs still hold up after all these years. I mean, a lot of the songs from this movie are pretty awesome. They're pretty well done. I'll gladly take this over some of the groups that we have nowadays, easily, no question about it. And, um, you know, this, this is the movie that gave us too much. This is the song that gave us Say You'll Be There. This is the song that the movie that gave us uh, Stop. I mean, these are really great songs 
that I remember I remember singing back then. I still sing nowadays. I mean, the songs are still incredible songs, but the movie, the the story they try to wrap around this is just abysmal. I mean, I cannot defend this movie by any means necessary. It's a really bad film. The music's awesome. The Spice Girls are awesome as a as a group as a whole, but the movie not so much. It's a film that quickly died a slow, painful death shortly after this came out, and you can really see why, because case in point of what I just showed you, so um, anyway, uh, let's see if we can turn the tide around. We've got Ben Affleck and Peter O'Toole in a movie that I'm sure is going to have some dramatic implications to it. Oh, no bodies, no graves, no witnesses. For centuries, they told us the terror would come from above. What if it came from below? It's nothing. It's here! It's all around us! What are we dealing with here? Biological, chemical, or other? I'm leaning toward other. Phantoms. Rated R. Starts everywhere January 23rd. Or we'll just put him in a horror movie together. I mean... I mean, why not? I mean, let's put Lawrence of Arabia and this rising star in Ben Affleck who is starring in Good Will Hunting when this is coming out. Let's take any of their good dramatic, good acting abilities and just push it off to the side. Let's let them star in this sci-fi horror movie from the Master of Suspense. Dean Co Really? Dean Koontz as the Master of Suspense? I mean, I, do I even need to say what's wrong with this movie? I mean, that line right there should pretty much tell you everything you need to know about what's wrong with this movie. I, it's not a good movie. It's not scary. It's just a lame ripoff of the X Files, and um, it's just—it's not a good movie. I mean, would you expect anything less from the same man that gave us Halloween: The Curse of Michael Myers? I don't think so. So, I think we could be pretty much quick on this one here. Uh, Phantoms. This should have stayed a Phantom. Just get away. Just like, if I'll take Danny Phantom over this Phantoms. So honestly, thank you very much. So, uh, yeah. Phantoms. Uh, on to the next movie, uh, Swept from the Sea. Once in a great while comes a love story that will stir your emotions and awaken your deepest desires. Critics hail Swept from the Sea as an inspired and epic romance, a film both hypnotic and beautiful. Vincent Perez wins your heart, and Rachel Weiss is captivating. I will love him until the end of the world. Swept from the Sea, rated PG-13. Opens tomorrow in select theater. I'm sorry, can I listen to that beginning of that trailer again? Once in a great while comes a love story that will stir your emotions and awaken your deepest desires. There was a film like that. It's called Titanic. It's still the number one movie at the box office at this time. Meanwhile, this film came and went, and you can kind of see why. It's about a doomed love affair between a simple country girl and a Ukrainian peasant who was swept onto the Cornish shore in 1888 after his immigrant ship sinks, sinks on its way to America. And um, I think you can pretty much tell where this is going. The movie itself is pretty forgettable, despite the fact that you have two good actors, Vincent Perez, Rachel Weisz. I mean, these are two very good actors. Also, Ian McKellen, Kathy Bates. A good cast overall here, but just directed by the same person that gave us to Wong Fu. Thanks for everything, Julie Newmar. And the film itself is just kind of bland and mediocre. It's just a generic romantic drama. They act like it's a sweeping epic that's destined to sweep as many awards as it can, but it's not. It's nothing like that whatsoever. It's a bland, mediocre film. So much so that I don't really have any much more, to, anything much more to say about it, honestly. So let's just go ahead and move on to the next movie, and that is John Grisham's The Gingerbread Man. We intend to prove that the respondent is mentally incompetent. He was a smart attorney. He follows me. Daddy stalks you. But he forgot the rules. That daughter is your client who rumor has it you're sleeping with. And put his family at risk. Now got my kids. Based on an original story by John Grisham. If anybody get that in their heads, I'll set up. The Gingerbread Man, a Robert Altman film, rated R. So Kenneth Branagh plays this lawyer who uses his power to help his love or put his father behind her father behind bars. But when he escapes, they all end up in danger. And you see Branagh along with Robert Downey Jr. as well as Robert Duvall. Uh, M. Biff Davids is also in here. Tom Berenger, Daryl Hannah, uh, Famke Jansen, Mae Whitman has an early role in here. And this is based off of a manuscript that John Grisham never used for a book. So this they just made this into a movie. And uh, directed by Robert Altman, I think it's because of Robert Altman that this film... That would have been seen as another uh, lackluster January film. Um, 
turns into something that actually isn't as bad as you would think it is. It's a decent film. It's nothing too cr incredible. It's not even the best adaptation of a John Grisham novel, honestly. But you have Robert Altman, you have Kenneth Branagh, you have Robert Downey Jr., you have a cast that of some really good talent involved in here, and a story that actually does work because the actors are putting their effort into it. I think they did a very good job with it, with the stuff that they were given to it. It's nothing too. Cl it's not a classic film by any means. It's nothing that is going to stand up with John Christian's other works that have been turned into films, but it's definitely a lot better than it could have easily been. I mean, Robert Altman usually will not will put his effort into it no matter what, and he definitely helps this movie come on big time to, sit, to prevent it from being a t complete disaster. And um, I think it works pretty well. It's nothing too grand, nothing too spectacular, but it works in the end. It's a decent film, a one-time watch for sure, Maybe not another one after that. So um, so that's The Gingerbread Man. And here's one that you're going to want to never watch again after watching it once. Uh, Slappy and the Stinkers. I really don't think I need to show you any more of that. I mean, I think, I think you get the gist of what this movie is about. You got a group of kids who have to save an abused sea lion from a greedy circus owner, so... It's pretty formulaic. It's not even that great, honestly. Plus, I swear this was shot back after The Little Rascals came out, because that kid, Travis Tedford, who plays Spanky in The Little Rascals, does not look like he's aged at all. And, I mean, I don't think he's aged all that much, because he was on The Amanda Show... Not too long after this, and the Amanda Show came out in 1999, so maybe he has aged a little bit. Maybe he has a, Maybe it doesn't look like he's aged since then. But um, honestly, when I see him now, is when I see him in this, I just keep thinking to myself, "There's no way that this film came out around the same time. This, that this film came out three years after the little four, year, four years after the Little Rascals, because that dude, that kid, looks like he's still in that same age bracket." But even with that, the movie itself is just bland and forgettable. It's a film you've seen done to death. You've seen where it's going to go. You see what's going to happen. They're going to split apart at the end. They're going to come up. They're going to eventually get everyone back together again when it's all said and done. It doesn't even have a good cast to really work off of it. B.D. Wong, Bronson Pinchot, Jennifer Coolidge, um, uh, Gary Leroy Gray, um, who else was in here? Sam McMurray. Um, it's a bland and forgettable movie. And uh, another winner from the Bubble Factory who just. Just call it. It's just call it quits, man. Like, just these movies that they make from the Bubble Factory have all been terrible, and uh, this is yet another one to add to that list. So, uh, let's try to end this on a little bit of a better note. Here's uh, Fallen Angels. Or at least I assume it's a better film than the last film we looked at. I've never seen it before, but um, judging by that cinematography, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this actually is a decent film. This is a film from Hong Kong. It's a neo-noir crime drama about two intertwined storylines. You have one that tells the story of a hitman who's wishing to leave the criminal underwood, underworld, uh, the prostitute he starts a relationship with, his agent who's infu infatuated with him. The other story is about a mute ex-convict on the run from the police and a mentally unstable woman dumped by her boyfriend. Set in 1995, pre-hand over Hong Kong. It explores the character's loneliness, their alienations, and their situations around them, and yearning for connections in a hectic city. And just from that little bit of the clips that I showed you there from the trailer, it just looks like a pretty f decent film. It's got some interesting camera angles here. The cinematographer of this is Christopher Doyle, and he's done a lot of movies. Like, as he did uh, the cinematography for stuff like Hero. He did the stuff. For, he did, actually did the cinematography for the infamous Gus Van Sant remake of Psycho. But he's done a ton of other cinematography that you may be familiar with. In the Mood for Love, he, uh, the aforementioned Hero, Rabbit Proof Fence, Quiet American, uh, Lady in the Water, Passion of Play. So he's had a good prolific cinematography career and you can definitely see that he's got the he's got the chops in this case but um yeah other than that though i don't really know too much about the movie itself i don't know if it's any good or not but um i'm assuming it's got to be good i mean that trailer looked pretty nice from the little bit that i is the full trailer looks pretty good i can only show a little bit there because of copyright reasons but um but yeah that's fallen angels so with that said that wraps up another edition of time about the movies and next time we meet we'll look at six more movies including Great Expectations, we also have Desperate Measures, uh, Deep Rising, Zero Effect, Deceiver, and Four Days in September. So six more movies to look at next time around. We'll double to those on the next episode. But until then, 
Uh, thank you very much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the playlist on the next page, check out the previous episode, and also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button to see more videos like this. So with that said, I will see you guys next time for another video, so until the next time I see you, take care.